we're here for Crossroads tonight, uh, Changes in Rural America, and we're just delighted to be able to host this exhibit. Um, thanks to Tennessee, uh, Humanities Tennessee, we were one of six sites in the state selected to host this exhibit. It is traveling from the Smithsonian. And I would like to introduce you to the two people who facilitated that for us and made this possible. Paul McCoy. Paul, would you stand up, please? Program Officer for Humanities Tennessee and Melissa Davis. And Melissa is the Director of Community History Programs. And also, they have one of their board members here tonight, Patsy Carson. Patsy, I've lost yeah. you. There she is. My baby. We're very grateful to each of you for making this possible. And I also want to thank Mary Alton. I know Mary will probably shoot me, but where are you, Mary? Uh, there she is. <laughs> Mary's done a tremendous job, not only with Crossroads, but with that timeline upstairs. It, there was a tremendous amount of work that she put in for a long time on that, and we're just so fortunate to have her. Um, also, I wanted to mention that Ten Humanities Tennessee is sponsoring uh, this event here tonight. We have catering by Ambiance. And Cody and Alex, we appreciate you being with us. Cody Kinsley and Alex Sharp, thank you for being here and being a part of this. Also, Scott Schroeder. Hey, Scott. Oh, God. With the Tennessee oh, God. Scott is uh, filming for us, and as always, he's always, always, always promoting this museum and walking right with us hand in hand in any of the projects we do. And I thank you for all the promotion you've done for this, Scott. And uh, the next lady does not really need an introduction. Whitney, where are you? Oh. <coughs> there you are. It's uh, just with great pleasure that I introduce Whitney Kimball Coe. And I think most of you all are like me. You watched Whitney grow up. She was our neighbor. Our dogs were best friends. <laughs> and um, of course, she belongs to Ellen and Art. And, um, but we're just delighted to have had the time and the opportunity to work with Whitney on this, <clears throat> pardon me, on this exhibit. And she is um, the National Director of Programs for Rural Strategies. So we're very fortunate to have Whitney's expertise in this community and uh, very thankful for her. And thank you, Art and Ellen, for giving us. <laughs> to stand out here if that's all right. Well, it's it's lovely to be with you all, Whitney Kimball Co., um, a daughter of Art and Ellen, sister <laughs> to Andrew Kimball, um, granddaughter of George and Mary Ellen Naff, um, daughter of Athens. These are, these are the things that are really precious to me and that um, I carry with me into every room, wherever I go, even if it's New York City or if it's in my hometown. Um, I'm really grateful to have been asked to work on this exhibit with um, Tennessee Humanities. I've been traveling around to these six sites um, and it will be installed and I think there are three more to go so they'll be doing these events in, in other communities in Tennessee so I'm looking forward to seeing how those conversations unfold in other communities but what I'm finding so far is that uh, communities are having a lot of the same conversations about where we are as small towns and rural places. We're definitely at a crossroads wondering, you know, what does the future hold for us? How much of that is within our control? How much of it feels like it's outside of our control? And how can we work together to get on the right, the path that we all um, feel is most unique and most, um, uh, most life-giving to us as small towns and communities? So we have this amazing panel here that um, uh, I'm really pleased to get to moderate here in just a few minutes. We promised you a presentation about rural America writ large and McMinn County kind of within all of that. Tim Merrima was supposed to be here. His um, father unfortunately became sick and he's had to travel to Michigan to be with him. But Tim sent me some slides, so I thought I would share them with you because I think they're, um, they're really informative. They're about rural America at large. Where is rural America right now? What does it look like? What are some of the challenges? What are some of the opportunities? Um, who lives there? Is it diverse? Is it becoming more diverse? Those kinds of things. And I thought you all would really appreciate it. 
He also sent some interesting slides about McMinn County, about our population, about employment numbers. Um, there's some slides in here about what, what it looks like maybe one of our biggest challenges are, or biggest challenges. Um, so I'm just going to proceed from there. So just so you know, I work for the Center for Rural Strategies. It's a national nonprofit that's focused on rural vitality writ large. Um, so we're interested in all kinds of things. We run the Rural Assembly, which is my main program area, and that's about bringing together rural leaders from across the country to work on issues that they find um, they have in common. So I get to travel a lot to do that. And then we also uh, produce the Daily Yonder, or publish the Daily Yonder. You can find that online. It's, it's at dailyyonder.com. It's a rural news site. And we publish stories about rural America, about rural voting patterns, about um, demographics, and about cultural news. And we're always looking for contributors. So if you fancy yourself a writer, or if you have a story to share, we'd love to publish it for you in the Daily Yonder. So, I think I've already, yeah. So we were founded in 2001, we look at social issues. So here's a map of the United States. Can you guess which color is rural? <laughs> yeah, and these are not political distinctions, it just so happened that uh, those were the colors that were used. But no, rural America is about 75% of, uh, of our land mass here in the United States. And we're about 19% of the population. So all this talk about rural being left behind, that's not good news because we make up a, a good percent of the land and the population. And when I say rural, I want you all to know that I'm talking about small towns, micropolitan places, places that maybe um, go from 10 people to up to 75,000 people, right? So there's all kinds of rural Americas out there. Rural America is diverse. One of the things that happens often in policy debates, in national news stories, is that rural America gets whittled down to a, a single story, right? We're, we're white, we're farmers, we're conservative, um, and we, we love to live off the land and we live in beautiful utopias in these small towns and we have no problems, but we want you to keep out. So that's often the story that gets told about rural in national news, and part of the reason rural strategies exist is to add some complexity to that, and also to make rural part of the national conversation so that perceptions change, because what we believe is that perception drives public policy. It drives decisions about places. And it's really important that the rest of the country knows that rural America is not only a farming place, or a place where we farm, it's not only a, a main street, um, it's a place that includes Muslim communities. Um, I was recently in Jackson, Mississippi, and they have an internet. They have the only international Muslim museum in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, uh, there's all kinds of uh, ways that we work off the land, but there's also all kinds of ways that we participate in technology and the and the digital economy. Um, so that's that's just something to remember that we are not a monolith. Um, there's so many. There's so many different rural Americas. But this is how it often gets painted in single stories, right? The hard truths of trying to save the rural economy. Um, we're called Trump country often, um, left behind. And, and the remedy for this so often is that rural people, it's people in small towns should be looking to cities for, um, for better livelihoods, better economies, and they should perhaps be moving there. If we don't want to um, continue to till the soil, then perhaps we should uh, pack up our stuff and like get on the Oregon Trail and, and go back to the city. Um, so these, these are the kind of stories that we need to be pushing back against, in part because the rest of the country really needs us. This is the proving ground for civil society. We, I feel like I know most of you in this room, and that in and of itself is a powerful place to be in this moment of political divisiveness and the breakdown of, of civil conversation. Um, we need to be telling a story about small towns in rural Americas where, um, where good things can happen because we know how to work together. We know how to show up together. If you can press that one more time. Thank you. Now there are some hard statistics about rural. Um, we are poor, sicker, less connected uh, than our urban counterparts. Those are all very true. These are some of the statistics that, you know, will make you sit up straight in your chair. 
One in four children um, live in poverty. 49% of rural Americans can't afford an unexpected $1,000 expense. This is true for the rest of the nation too, but it's true at a higher rate for rural people. There's a housing crisis here. Our hospitals are often closing. Rural mortality is higher. Addiction rates are, are really noticeable. Broadband's an issue. And access to capital is an issue, which many of us who work in um, the nonprofit sector or who are looking um, as city officials or county officials to grow businesses, capital is an issue, trying to figure out how are we gonna get that capital. Um, so these are all real, and we need to acknowledge that these are real issues. But we also know that we're full of opportunity, full of assets, and it, all you have to do is look at McMinn County to see that. Um, we have so much civic and social capital here. We have such a convening power. I mean, all of you all in this room, there's so much going on tonight even. There are people who are not in this room because there are about six different meetings going on outside um, in other nonprofits and, and organizations around the community. Um, this is from, some of these statistics are from a poll that was put out in 2018 um, by Harvard and NPR that found that 75% of rural Americans rate the overall quality of life in their community as excellent or good. And a majority are optimistic that they can make an impact in their local community. And then we have this group of people who are moving home. Um, I consider myself one of these, part of this group. Seth's part of this group. Haley, you, maybe you'll be part of this group after Spillman. <laughs> um, coming home, and Tyler. Um, so coming home after you go away for a while and get your education perhaps, coming home and, try, and raising a family here, putting back down roots, homecomers are really driving a new um, way of life and economy and optimism in rural places. Something else to consider is that just writ large in rural America, um, a, there's really a transition across um, work. What does work look like? It's not just, it's no longer just in coal mines or in um, industry or um, in extractive um, corporations that actually there's a lot of creativity um, around creating new economies. Um, there's a lot of diversity in organizing among immigrants and farm workers and that's creating a whole new set of cultures and values. Um, recreation, green energy, all of these things make rural America perhaps the next cool place. Mm -hmm. And the question for us in a lot of ways while we're standing at the crossroads is how do we hold on to the things that we love about our place, keep it unique and connected and special and you know precious to us, and then also grow it at the same time? Um, we don't want to be Atlanta. That's not who we are, right? But, um, but we want to have a, a good quality of life. All right, so here's some of these slides that Tim uh, sent to me. What was happening here? Do you remember? 2008, 2010? Yeah, the recession. So, um, McMinn County lost about 15% of its jobs during the recession. And we're not quite back yet. This is 2018, right here. Um, we're about 7% away from what we lost. And this graph also doesn't account for, for quality of jobs. You know, if this, if, how, um, how many of us um, understand what underemployment feels like. Um, it's something to think about. And as we think about what the future of work looks like in our community, how do we make sure that we get high quality, good paying jobs so that our families and our children can thrive? <coughs> Here's our population. <coughs> Athens and McMinn County and um, surrounding areas are notable. Um, because we are growing. A lot of small communities are not seeing population growth, they're actually seeing declines. Um, but we're actually growing, and we're, we're seeing um, migration in from homecomers, we're seeing migration in from um, people who are coming to work in our new industries. Um, there's also this opportunity, I think, in, in our small community to jumpstart <coughs> local businesses. Um, and to pull in new people to do that. So, so there is a growth trend here, and that's something to be really excited about and proud of. That's the highlight, okay. But here's the challenge, here's the real challenge, and I think we all know this to be true if you just look around. Um, we are dealing with poverty in our community, and we're not unique. 
a lot of communities are dealing with it. Um, but Beckman County has higher poverty rates, higher child poverty rates, and a lower medium household income than the rest of the nation. And that is significant um, in a time when we say we're, ha we're in a good economy. I'm not saying we're not ha there's, an, there's not a booming economy out there, but it's not booming for a lot of people. There are a lot of people who are being left behind. And there's a narrative that goes along with rural that says that we just need to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and that it's, it's a matter of behaviors and it's a matter of, um, of choices. But often what we forget is that they, these are deeply structural issues that we need to be thinking about. What, the things that drive poverty and the things that drive um, low-paying low jobs, those are structural in a lot of ways. And there's a role for philanthropy and private investment and there's a role for government in those, top, in those issues. So, um, so this I believe to be, and Tim would agree with me, our challenge in McMinn County is how do we nourish our families and our children so that we can continue that upward growth and adding more high quality jobs and having the life that we know we want, we, that everybody should have here. And then, you know, we've been in this room before, I think within the last year, to do an asset mapping exercise where we got to talk about all the things that we know exist in McMinn County. There's, we have so much here that we can build upon and leverage um, to make a difference in the lives of ourselves and, and everyone else. Civic and social capital. We have school systems. We have a hospital. That's, that's huge. We have banks. We have, um, we have sidewalks, I didn't put that on there. We have, we have local philanthropy, we have local businesses. We have multiple institutions for higher learning, that of higher learning, that's huge. Um, and we are in this really interesting spot, that's the Eureka Trail by the way, I'm not sure who I stole that picture from, but thank you, whoever took it. What I, what I think our crossroads, um, the crossroads for Mittman County really is, is that we are in a sweet spot. We're right between Knoxville and Chattanooga. We don't want to be Knoxville, and we don't want to be Chattanooga, and we don't want them to subsume us, I don't imagine. But we benefit from their proximity, but we're far enough away from them that we can create our own economy. We can create our own culture and our own experience here in this community, um, and that's where the sweet spot is, with more local businesses, more local initiative, um, more willpower and more vision, I think that's where we are right now. That was Civic Saturday most recently. We had um, 80, over 80, 82 people, and it was the Youth Civic Saturday, and it was at Surf Pro in downtown Athens. It was a bunch of young people who um, gave beautiful testimony about our civic duty and civic responsibility, and I just thought that picture is just so telling. Spaces, they're so precious. So, you know, we want to we want to figure out how do we move ahead and uh, keep these people tethered in in a really healthy way to the things that we love here. Send them out into the world, of course, to do what they need to do, but and hope that they'll want to come back and have the quality of life here that that they deserve. I just wanted to put this out there. I know this is a countywide event, but we did have. A while back, I don't think I was here for this, um, there was an event called Athens Alive that invited a bunch of pu public officials and um, business owners and community leaders to come together and come up with you know, a set of recommendations for what they'd like to see in this community by 2035. And there's a list of the things that they came up with here. I think there were more than that, but these are the top 10 things. And they included stuff like more recreational facilities, um, more public relations um, from our city uh, departments, uh, more pedestrian and walkable places, um, uh, an increase of uh, citizen participation in civic dialogue, more need for community involvement, more emphasis on codes enforcement. Uh, bless you all, bless you. Um, and I don't know what the bypasses thing might have been, but, um, but anyway, that's the list, and I just didn't want to lose it because this kind of work gets done all the time. I feel like we have these conversations a lot, and sometimes we forget to, that there's a through line and we need to connect them, connect back to them. So I just wanted you to see and uh, maybe remember that, that, that we've talked about these things before. 
And finally, this is one of my favorite exercises when I give a presentation about rural strategies. We had a rural youth assembly in Santa Fe in 2010, and we invited these 50 young people from across the country, all different communities. We had Native Americans, we had rural Hawaiians, we had people from the Midwest, from Appalachia, the Delta. Um, we asked them to make a vision statement for rural America writ large. And it was a terrible idea, because you can't put 50 people in a room and ask them to make a vision statement. Um, and so what we ended up doing was having each one of them write a sentence and then put it up on the board. And ultimately, we were able to string together common thoughts and similar sentences. So this, is, this still is an original piece of work from these 50 people. Um, but this is what we came up with, and I love to read it aloud. So if you can see it, I'd love for you to read it with me. I think it's really inspiring. Here we go. We demand of ourselves a proactive and invested community that has quality health care, adequate housing, and enlightened education in a safe and sustainable environment where no person goes thirsty, hungry, or homeless and every person is accepted, no matter who your mama is. All these things done with love tell the story of our future in rural communities. So there you have that. So I've I put all these um, slides into a PDF, and I'm happy to share it with anybody who would like to just have them. So you have some of these numbers. And also, I think just carrying this around in your pocket and reading it occasionally as, as you would read, you know, whatever the most seminal thing in your life is, uh, it's inspiring. So let's move on to this conversation, yeah? So I bet pretty much everybody in this room knows all these faces up here, but I'd love to have them introduce themselves um, and say, make, say one sentence about... Well, I think I'm changing my mind about what I want you to say. <laughs> I want you to respond to one thing that I've presented just now. Just um, what stands out to you that you would like to explore more, maybe not here today, but just in general, what would you like to explore more based on the information you just heard? So introduce yourself, say your, your affiliation, and, and then respond. Howdy, I'm Seth Sumner, I'm your city manager uh, here in the city of Athens. The uh, the thing that stands out the most, and it's actually in your slideshow here, I want to go back and show, um, let's talk about this because this is, this is serious, is the level of poverty in our community. Um, and I think most all of us sitting in this room um, are very blessed but we are unlike the majority of our neighbors. Um, look at McMinn County, 39000 for median household income. That's wonderful. I wish that was the case for the city of Athens. We could get a Chick-fil-A if that was the city of Athens. The city of Athens is 31000 That's our median household income. Poverty within our city we have the fourth most impoverished school system in the state of Tennessee. Out of 141 systems, we are dirt poor within our city. That's our big issue. Thank you. I'm Haley McMahon. I'm a senior at McMahon County High School. And um, I definitely agree with the poverty issue uh, going throughout the county school and also city schools, you um, you know when you see someone who is less fortunate than you and I have been in classes with people who I know are less fortunate than me and it's uh, it was a shock at first but now it's become something that you just see every day when you know that someone has to like go to the office to get clothes for the night or you um, know that someone has to be sent food home and I think that's definitely something that we need to work on as a community is uh, finding a way to help those people that are less fortunate than us in this room. Thank you. John Gentry, McMinn County Mayor, and um, we kind of had some advanced notice of some questions and topics, and uh, I was kind of looking through those today, and uh, pretty much uh, Whitney has uh, mentioned every one of my answers already <laughs> in, in her presentation, so I can step down at this point. Um, but we were talking 
uh, in the office. And again, it was about poverty. And we were talking about a generation that came through the Depression. And uh, in Appalachia, people say, we didn't know we were poor. Poverty is also a mentality. And they worked hard and they had pride. And I said, you know, how do we change that narrative of how we see ourselves? Where poverty is not determined by a check or monetary value, but by purpose and self-worth. Because I think when we drain purpose from people, that drains their worth. Mm -hmm. And when we uh, empower them to realize they are created with purpose, then with passion, they will go after prosperity. <laughs> and so that's where I think something has to be addressed, that we cannot define poverty by dollar signs. So some uh, kind of passion about. Uh, good evening, I'm Tyler Forrest. And I apologize in advance for a three and a half week cough that's still going strong. So it, I promise I'm not contagious. So look the other direction if I do cough. So, uh, I, I will say I, I could easily echo everything that's been said. Uh, but first of all, I'm a, I'm a proud Athenian and I'm thrilled to be here tonight. I certainly think the economy um, is, is certainly a major issue. However, I would like to throw a little different spin on, spin on it and say, the real importance of that is diversifying our economy, growing uh, professional level jobs, those middle income jobs, as well as the skilled labor jobs. I think there's certainly a demand for both, but as a community, we've got to come together and fulfill both of those needs. Good evening. My name is Ann Boyd. I'm president of the McMahon County branch in NAACP, but I also love history, and part of our history, uh, being a rural community, is um, we look at ourselves as, you know, we're not country, we're a friendly city. Um, it's really great to be in Athens, but, um, you know, it's been a long time since I've been um, part of the workforce. But I think, uh, looking at my family and my children, grandchildren, I don't think they have the uh, same opportunities to advance as well as we did because the medium uh, range of uh, wages is so low. There's jobs, there's a lot of jobs in our county and the country, but the wages are low and I agree with Tyler. We need um, jobs that are more office jobs or jobs that pay well so that uh, people can advance and we're not in that poverty uh, state that oh, everybody else has talked about. I'm Jim Caldwell. Uh, I'm a retired freight train conductor with the CSX Railroad and I'm associated with the Edible Historical Commission. And uh, while I agree with uh, my predecessors here, I came from a uh, the railroad that when I started working we had a five-man crew. Today there may be two men on the crew. In a lot of cases there's one. It is a good paying job but the labor force has been decimated by 60 to 80 percent. Now, on a lighter note, I think that we are unique. This area is unique, and I'm looking beyond city limits. If you will look at what we have had, not too distant past, we have had Olympic events. We have had a 100-mile race through the area. We've had a number of events we had an international glider uh, program, competition. We have had a number of events that have been international events. And really, I think that we need to really check our area and put some check marks at where we are mostly blessed. Look at the rivers, look at the hiking trails, look at the 
bird watchers. Look at what people come here to do because of the uniqueness of the area. And I honestly think that it has potential to increase our income. But it's going to take some planning. It's going to take some education. We have got to educate our local people on what is available for them to do. We had 16,000 people ride the train up the uh, Hawassi Gorge this year. I look back at the guest register for three years in the Etowah Depot. And that's, you're not required to sign in when you come. We ask you to please sign our guest register. We have had people from 45 states and nine foreign countries sign that guest register. People, there is a market out there. We have got to define it and we have got to utilize it. And um, I'm going off script again. Sorry, you all studied the questions I sent you, but now I have I have more because I think you're you all are um, you're representative of the of our community in a lot of ways, and you've you've all been very involved in different pockets and sometimes overlapping, sometimes not. Um, I want to direct this to Seth, but if others would like to respond to it, please raise your hand. Um, so uh, Seth and I are involved with an organization called Think Tennessee, which is a, a new nonpartisan, they're calling themselves kind of a think tank for Tennessee, where they do a lot of research and data mining about how we're doing in comparison to the rest of the country and what, what our opportunities are and what we need to work on. And they've pulled together a coalition of mayors from across the whole state. And, and maybe one city manager. And one city manager. <laughs> and maybe Mayor Gentry, maybe you're part of this too. I didn't ask you a lot of emails. <laughs> yeah, you get a lot of emails. Um, but Seth was quoted in one of their press releases today, and I um, and I really appreciated that he was chosen along with Mayor Burke to be quoted, and that McMinn and Athens get a lot of uh, are getting a lot of traction in Tennessee as a place that is really working hard to have difficult conversations. Um, or have you know lots of diverse voices at the table and have difficult conversations about how we move forward together. And I wanted to ask you and the rest of the panel, like we live in a country right now that's deadlocked on so many issues and it has to, you know, there's, the, there's party line and there's ideological lines and there are, there's economies and, um, uh, and uh, income. So we're divided in all kinds of ways. So how do we as a small town, utilize the power of our relationships and, um, and our practice at civic engagement to move forward together, to come up with you know, um, the right answers to these questions about poverty and, and new economies. This is, um, I'm so happy you're going way off script. Um, <laughs> really challenging. No, but, but, but we, we, we have to challenge ourselves. Uh, I tend to disagree with the notion that we're any further apart than we've ever been politically uh, as, a, as a society and as a country. Um, what we have lost is the ability to sit down with each other and with people that we disagree with and have conversations. We're not trusting in each other and when you don't have a foundation of trust within your neighborhood, within your town, within your community, you can't have a conversation. We were talking earlier today about an approach of us making sure that we know the people that, that what their point of view is on the other side of whatever the issue is. We pull them in and we get to know each other for the purpose of it's a whole heck of a lot harder to talk bad or think bad about somebody that you know. Right? Simple human nature, things like that. So uh, what we're challenged with is tackling... Uh, let, me, let me soapbox for a minute. <coughs> we have serious problems in our community, and our community is no different than any other community. Think about uh, this boom in Chattanooga. They've got the problems that we have. They're different scales, different levels, but it's all the same problems. We've got drug abuse, uh, we've got domestic violence, uh, we have the breakdown of the family unit, 
Um, these things occurring in all communities and throughout the world, okay? We're no different than anybody else in that context, but how do we approach it? We can't tackle this community's big problems if we can't sit down and talk about them. And we're not willing to sit down and talk to the people that disagree with us. We have to fight our own human nature. What's the first thing you think of when somebody disagrees with you? You're wrong. <laughs> You're wrong. And, and, and if, if you don't agree with me, then there's something wrong with you. you you're, either, you're either dumb or you're just mean. You're just evil. We automatically, you know, play the superhero movie in our head that, you know, this, this person's the villain because they don't, they don't agree with me. And it's not true. We, we all have different points of view. But what we're lacking now, I think more than ever, is that etiquette and that decorum to treat our fellow humans with the respect that we all deserve. So we can sit down and disagree and then go have a meal together. That's how business gets done. And that's what I hear uh, uh, old retired legislators when they talk about going to the state capitol and how things used to be. That's what I hear them say. It's like, we, we would fight it out. We'd have a fist fight on the floor verbally. And then we'd go have dinner together. We were friends. We didn't have to agree all the time, but we were friends and we worked together. And it, there's this thing that we really need to draw in and concentrate on, and it's called the art of compromise. Let's make sure that we all get a little bit instead of winner take all. Thank you. Um, we can come back to that, and I know you all might have other thoughts about it. I wanted to ask Kaylee a question that's a little off script, but it's totally in your wheelhouse. You're good. Um, Haley has been accepted to Spelman University, and you're. Yeah. When, when do you go? This fall. Yes. yes. So she starts at Spelman this fall, which is just <coughs> extraordinary, and we're also proud um, to know you. Um, a question I have for you is: as you make your way to Spelman, what from your experience of growing up here are you taking with you, and what? Do you hope to bring back here if you would if you were to come back here? What would you hope to bring back? So, what are you taking with you from here, and what would you hope to bring back? Um, I actually I haven't committed to Spelman, but oh. I. <laughs> it's okay. I'm not Spelman. <laughs> but, Sorry. But I um I do plan on going there in the fall. I applied to Emory University also over uh, my winter break, and um. I basically got the same type of question. The question was, what do you plan on bringing from your community to Emory University's community? I've lived in Athens all my life. Um, we are known as the friendly city. And I think that to be friendly is to be kind. And as a community, like um, Whitney said earlier, most everyone in this room knows each other. And I think that's very special because you can go to a bigger city and everyone is so rude to each other but in Athens I don't think we are like that you know you see someone in Walmart and you'll have a conversation with them even if you don't know them and um, <laughs> I think as I go to Spelman I want to be different from the girls that are there but also I want to learn from their communities and I want to bring that friendliness to them because I know that as we are all going through this anxiety filled experience of moving away from home I know that someone is going to need a friend and I would want someone else to be that way with me I if I were to come back home which I'm sure I may come back home for a few years I would love to bring back with me the sisterhood that is um, that Spelman is built upon. When I got accepted in my acceptance letter, they said, welcome to the sisterhood of Spelman, something like that. And um, I also toured there, and I think that that environment of sisterhood also goes along with the environment here of friendliness. Um, to have a sisterhood or a brotherhood with everyone around you, you feel like you can tell them anything that you're going through, 
and you feel like you can open up to them and I think that's something that we also have in this community but it's something I would definitely want to bring back as I uh, if I come back thank you Mayor Gentry I'm gonna stay on script if you don't mind because I do want to ask um, I do want this question to be um, tackled um, as mayor of McMahon County um, for many many years what in what do we do really well here in this county what are we what are we excelling at do you think and then also where are we falling short as a community you could speak like about sure, to community I, uh, or as a <laughs> uh, but what are we doing really well I'm interested in your thoughts on that we do this very well um, this, this community has always worked you know, our tagline is make it in McMinn and we talk about jobs and we always talk about the unemployment and I had a friend tell me John I hear you you'll talk about you know we're harking on this five you know right now it's 3.8 percent unemployment and what do we do to get those 3.8 I said you know we never talk about the 96 percent that's getting up every morning and going to work and building this community and they're that silent majority that has built this county and built that reputation. Um, we have one of the highest percentages in the state of Tennessee as far as our workforce involved in manufacturing. And here's where some of the statistics start really getting confusing and really tell a different story. Our manufacturing wage is higher than the national average of manufacturing wages. We're above the nation for that 33%. 34% that's involved in manufacturing. And that sometimes hurts us recruiting because the consultants know that. And so they know when they locate here, they're going to have to compete against the average $85,000 a year salary at Bowwater. <coughs> the average 60 something thousand dollar a year salary at Johns Manville. You know that, and they are always looking to make that product cheaper. You know, they'll tell you they want to great try that great living wage but they're gonna go where they can get their basic needs and get it cheaper so that sometimes has hurt us in the recruitment they know our wage structure it's 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 good in manufacturing um the frustrating part is that you know what's the service industry is low one of the challenges i had written down for the economy really tyler mentioned this is the loss of the white collar job here where we had a homegrown industry uh, now I really believe I think about my personal experience of where I bought my house and it belonged to um, previously to a, an executive with Athens furniture oh. and he had to sell you know and I thought about that sales force that just Athens furniture had and they had 600 employees but they probably had 50 or 60 what we just thought you know white collar administrative executive level position that we lost and then I think of the banking community of what just through the natural and this happens everywhere it's not unique to Athens but I mean, in county by any means but I think of what we lost in that area and uh, I was actually meeting with two consultants last night uh, that came in from Atlanta looking um, in our area and then basically the same question sell sell me on your community and then some of your challenges and I said uh, we don't have an architect in the county I don't have an engineering firm in the county. The flip side is we're close to Chattanooga and Knoxville. You get to choose from both. Go right here to exit 49, go right or left, 50 minutes. We can get you 30 or 40 either way. And that, that, can, that helps. But there's that, that white collar professional, uh, you know, black return, that's what we're lacking. That, and they, those people bring a different energy, all you know, different skill sets. And I think we've lost some of that. Um, we talk about population growth, you know, we're going to be hearing a lot about census 2020 and, and telling and reminding folks, hey, it's not a government conspiracy, it's in the, it's in the Constitution. We're not creating this to, to learn about what's on your house. It's, you know, it, you, you know, you should be for this. It's in the Constitution. And, um, you know, we're, we're trying to do what, what kind of projections. So I kind of went back and I, I looked up motor vehicle registrations. And in 2017, the last number I had was, I think it was close to 58,000 vehicles in the county. And I said, wow, is that a one-to-one? -one? So I went back to the 2000 census, the 1990 census, 
1980 census, 1970 census, and I pour the DMV numbers, and it's always almost a one-to-one -one ratio. So while UT has us at 53, if that tends, we may be close to 60,000. And then when they pulled some numbers uh, through nominal address, and they said there might have been a considerable undercount in the 2000 census. So uh, we got to tell people, make sure. And I, my tagline is, if you want Chick-fil-A, you better fill out your 2020 census, because that means we need the number. You know, so... Uh, so we work really well, and we don't celebrate them enough. Uh, so I'm, I'm oh my gosh. over here. No, 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 that's great. I have a bingo card out there somewhere so that every time somebody says Chick-fil-A, yeah. somebody's going to win. Oh, oh we've we done it three times. This is all we ever hear. Again. Oh, my gosh. Chick-fil-A knows more about us than we know about us. Oh, wow. um, these are all really thoughtful answers. I hope you're getting some thought-provoking comments here, and I wish we had you know, a ton of time to really dig in um, and ask even more questions, but Tyler, you and I are part of a group called AMP, right? Um, all, mo all modern, McMahon modern. Ma all McMahon modern, what? Mo all McMahon modern professionals. All McMahon modern professionals. I just call it AMP because that's a really cool way to say it. It's, it is, it's for young professionals, um, and Tyler and Seth and I are all um, participating in that. It's really cool to have that, um, that group. Um, I imagine that you're uh, coming back to Athens or living here in McMinn County um, has something to do with a, a desire for a certain kind of quality of life. Um, and I'd just love to hear kind of your story about what it is to be a 30-something year old young professional here in Athens um, in McMinn County. Sure. Thank you, Whitney. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, a question I was hoping you would ask me because I've thought a lot about that one, uh, believe it or not. Uh, as, as, a, as a ninth generation McMinn County, and you know, I've always had quite an affinity toward this community, and, in, and you know, I went to the public schools here. I, graduated from McMinn County High School, and when I did, I, I went to the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga in 2006, and I always had a connection back to this community, even though I lived in Chattanooga for 11 years, but during that time, I, I always <coughs> kept up with everything. I, I thought, you know, if the opportunity ever presents itself, I would love to go back there, and I'd I'd sort of gotten to a point where I really did not think that would happen. My career had progressed to a, a point where it was growing, it didn't make a lot of sense, I would have to commute, and some circumstances changed, and in 2017, I convinced my wife, who's a Nashville native, to move to uh, the friendly city, and uh, we did, and mainly because of the, the quality of life, uh, the school system, and I will tell you, Quite candidly, for me, the biggest drive was knowing that the investment that had been made in me from this community for so many years, quite frankly, from many of you in this room, I wanted to be able to do that for other people as well. And, and that was really the selling point for me. Today, I drive 55 minutes to work, and some people say, well, you're crazy. But the flip side of that is I get to come home every night here, uh, we get to be engaged in this community, we get to be engaged with each of you, and I think that has been a major plus for my family. And I can say, since my wife is not here tonight, although uh, she might not tell you, she would also say that's a plus for our family. It's been a big transition for her, but she now realizes too many of the things that I had talked about in the sense of community that this place offers. We're the sweet spot for you guys. Um, that's wonderful. So, Anne, I can't see you, but I am going to partially stick to the script, but then I'm going to like give it a little spin here. Um, I, I wanted. I asked everyone uh, if you were to bring someone to McMahon who'd never been here, what would you highlight for them? And an addendum to that for you, since you're a history buff, is you know, is there a piece of history here or a story here? that you would want to highlight but has maybe been erased or maybe there's a there's a gem here that is not told often enough so maybe you've got something you want to show them but maybe there's also a gem don't, don't give me the answer Jim <laughs> 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 
today I am. <laughs> uh, definitely, I would talk about McMinn, uh, Athens, Etowah area being close to the mountains. As Jim was saying, all the resources that we have in this area. But uh, been that history buff, I think there's a piece of history. As a matter of fact, I just got a call today from the Tennessee Museum um, asking me about my research on a piece of history in McMinn County. Uh, William Richards and his grandmother, Hannah Richards. Um, Hannah was a slave that was freed, and she had a child named Mary, and then she had a son named William. William was uh, actually um, raised in McMahon, and here in Athens, um, went to Har um, Howard University, and he was associated with uh, a lady named Julia B. Nelson, who was huge in the women's suffrage movement. Uh, she was from Minnesota, and of course William came back to Athens after he graduated from Howard University. He was a lawyer. He obtained his law degree, a uh, lawyer's not degree, but his law, he was um, admitted to the bar here in McMinn County. He um, um, had trials in McMinn County, but he was also uh, a mayor here in McMinn County. He was the first black mayor in Athens, not McMinn County, but Athens. Um, he, uh, he came back to take care of his mother, and when his mother passed, he went back to D.C. And uh, his history is, uh, his uh, records from his life are in the Library of Congress. And as uh, the guy from Tennessee Museum told me, he said, it's very unusual for our, you have to be really something to have your, law, uh, your records in the Library of Congress. And um, one other thing that was interesting about him, he was also one of the lawyers that, was, that founded the NAACP when they began in 1909. He was one of he was on that board with William with W. E. B. Du Bois, and uh, it, there's just a huge history that hasn't been told. I I did a presentation of, uh, probably about two or three years ago, and then there's a picture upstairs in the hallway that Mary's put up there. But that's just one of the things that's uh, part of the history in McMinn County, and it's not necessarily that. It has to be an African American history. It's all the history that's here in McMinn County that I love to explore and find out who's connected to who. And, you know, one of the families that I, I like to research, and there's a lady in Atlanta that's uh, a friend of mine, or I've got to know her, is uh, the Clegg family. And she's connected with the Cleggs here in Athens. So I'm excited. Um, to maybe one day get her to come up and do a presentation on. She's got a lot of research on her family as they started here in, in Athens. So I've got one, one more question for Jim, and then I have one pop-up question for the whole group so you have time to think about it. Jim, you don't get any time to think about this. Um, so because you're last and because you're a Jim, um, I'm going to give you a wild card, so you just get to, you get to pick any of the questions that I asked. If you want to respond to those, you can, or one of those you can, or if there's something that you feel like needs to be said in this space right now that has not been said, I want you to say it. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> one thing that I have thought a lot about, in fact, last night about 3 a.m., I thought about it, and uh, when I was asked to sit on this panel and went through the crossroads, I think that this area is one of the really great crossroads that you can come up on because of what is available to you, and there's I think there is a large lack of knowledge, and I'm not saying we're dumb, we're just uninformed on what we do have that is available to us, and perhaps could be very instrumental in growth 
not just numbers, but in money growth. You look what we look what we've got. We've got all of this. I mean, we've got people that are driving hours to come to see some of the things that we've got in the area. Uh, I have talked to a number of people at the Crane Festival, and they drive six, seven hours to come see the to come see the birds. You look at the people that come through here to go to Star Mountain, hike the area, see what's available, all of these rafters. What we need to do is we need to look at, and I'm not saying this is in a negative manner, but the only constant there is is change. And the impact of change is based on the amount of planning and recognizing your assets to really further the quality of your area. And we have the people to do it. But like I said, nothing is constant but change. Utilize it to your advantage. Plan it. Use it. Thanks. Um, so when we think about change, I think sometimes we find that it's scary and we tend to pull back from it and, uh, and want to deflect it or ignore it or, um, or just lean on what we're used to. So we have an opportunity, as we know, right, sitting right in front of us all the time to, uh, to confront change and make the most of it. But it takes some courage. So I want you all to think about, for just a moment, what, is, what would be an act of courage in the next 10 years? So if you think about 2035, go back to that slide that um, Athens Alive in 2035. What would be an act of courage that you either personally could make or that you think our community collectively could make? We're going to earn that title, Friendly City. It's, it's easy to, uh, to talk bad about that, about a single experience that ruined your whole uh, Athens, uh, uh, McMinn County experience. Uh, and that's that's not fair. What I would like to see as as the challenge uh, amongst ourselves is creating a safe environment where we have a natural trust in each other, where we can have the difficult discussions that we need to make the difficult decisions that lead this community in better directions. I want you to think about that. That is, that is hard. That is hard. We sit down with folks that we disagree with and come to a compromise, make a decision, and move forward. We have to work against our own human nature to do that. I think that's a real challenge. We can do it in our homes. We can do it in our churches, in our neighborhoods. Um, but uh, I would love to to be able to have a group like this that we can just sit down and discuss things, an idea laboratory, somewhere that we can go and we can hammer out the tough issues and walk out with something that we can do about it to improve the human condition in McMinn County. I think standing up for diversity and the um, opportunities that that more diverse people are given would be something that I would like to see. Um, you know, having my mom, as my mom has given me the opportunity to have more opportunities than the people that I go to school with that are like me, that are black, you know, that are Latino, that are Asian. You know, I think that in Athens, yes, there is a diverse community, but what about all the opportunities that they, that white people have that the diverse or the minorities don't have? And I, um, I definitely think that standing up 
for people that look like you or the people that don't look like you is something that takes a lot of courage because there are some people that definitely wouldn't do that. In the world that I live, I guess, daily in, in government, you talk about courageous, uh, courageous uh, which is another word for uh, confrontational in my life. Word. Um, and that's, you know, I remember just a little thing like the Eureka Trail. And, um, you know, we'd been visiting other communities and just, uh, it was, you know, to me, it was a no brainer. You know, it was a quality of life issue, it was a health issue. My, my father's 76 now, and I went by the house and he had his bike rack. And, you know, and he's, he's, he's riding his bike on the Eureka Trail. It's a health issue. And I remember the opposition. And, you know, I just remember saying, we have a, and really when we got started on the Eureka Trail, we had an opportunity probably 20 years ago on some, on some rail, maybe behind Mayfield, that was abandoned. Would you really get to I guess I thought back then to, to kind of try to acquire that for a trail, and and then they said, well, you know, this is going to be abandoned, and um, I remember said, guys, we don't get this now. Are our kids going to say, you had a chance to get us a trail and you didn't do it? Mm. You know, and we look back and we're like, the, some of the folks that were most adamant against it are using it. And I was talking <laughs> to Parks and Recreation, Austin Fesmeyer said, one of the guys, it was a guy who lives on the trail, and he came and apologized to Austin. And said, so, you know, I, I just, I was just scared that all these people were going to be walking by my house, and I might get robbed. He's a great guy, and, he, and now he, he said, I, I have friends on the, I know the normal people that use it, and we're friends, and it's just a, a great thing. And I thought, you know, how do we identify those things? That it, um, I don't know if that was courageous. It, that might have been just low hanging fruit, but in, in my line of work, when I look at Tennessee government, local government, and I see technology, and I, I see some things are archaic. And at some point, we have to have a conversation. Um, why can't a citizen go to one office and get six different things instead of going to see every one of us? You know, it, it's not, Tennessee's model isn't really, and I'm saying it's not based for efficiency, it's based for checks and balances. And so, how, you know, we're smart people in this state, how can we get both? You know, because it takes your money to provide for all of us to do this for you. And I, you know, most of you know me. I just rather you keep your money. Uh, you're gonna spend it better. I am. I promise you that most of the time. So, um, all the time. Um, you know, so that, that's gonna have to be something we look at in Tennessee on how we structure uh, the delivery of governmental services. And that's, I don't know if that's courageous or crazy, but we're gonna have to have that at some point. <laughs> Thinking about this, I realize I, I very well might step on somebody's uh, toes with what I'm going to say. Uh, Be courageous. Uh, partic <laughs> per, 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 uh, particularly Mayor Gentry, but uh, I, I think what the city just did in agreeing to bonded debt for its school system was a critical move. And I think it's going to be very courageous for McMinn County to step out as a debt-free county and you passed yeah. but as, as a as a debt free county and fund what is likely many many millions of dollars in school improvements that are needed and I, I it brings me back to what I read on the board back there a diverse uh, thriving rural community has a very strong updated school system. So I, I think we have to think about that and I think that's going to take some real courage on behalf of the county to do that. This is probably my pet peeve. We need internet in rural areas. Amen. Because I live between all these uh, little small towns that have internet, I don't have access to high-speed internet where I live in between Riceville and Calhoun. And it's ridiculous that cell phone, home phone, whatever is AT&T, and AT&T cannot uh, run internet to my house. And I've probably at least three or four times a year, I will send them an email, 
i'll send it to our state representative we need internet in rural areas because my grandson was staying with me in last semester he had a class that required him to do bridge sales and use the internet at home but he stayed at school so that he would have the high speed internet because he could not do it from our house it our the little wi-fi is not fast enough so that would be my one act of courage is to go before whoever i could find that's the thing is finding the right person to get something done in an area or you know we need a high speed internet yeah i'm volunteering yeah i hear that all the time actually when we move them, <laughs> they'll say okay we're coming we're two minutes away we got this one if, if well, you can county paid the grant match the first county to do that for a utility we and it's going to be where in, in the Sanford Rascal area where I am. From Highway 30, uh, that going towards Decatur to the south end quadrant. That that was area. South end of what? The county. Plus they had that direction. Okay. Down Spring Creek Ridge, and that's according to Volunteer Electric. So. Then that's still going to be my act of courage to stand out there when they come that way to make sure that they come <laughs> by my house. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I always welcome you to the friendly setting. <laughs> But now I do have a solution what? to your problem. Mm -hmm. You can get Nancy from the robocalls yes. to make all of these calls for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get AT and T that can't take care of the robocalls to to hook you up with Nancy. <laughs> I think that one of the positive things that we have seen here tonight is the fact that we're sitting down with a large group of people and we're discussing our positives as well as our negatives. We need to take care of our positives. We need to keep them. We need to elaborate on them. Also, we need to sit down as a group and challenge our negatives and come up with a solution. Meetings like we're having here tonight and the other group, the other part of the group will be glad to take any questions you have. <laughs> but let's sit down and talk about it. Let's come up with a solution. Let's make a positive change. And thank you for involving us in this situation. Thank you, Ann. Thank you. Thank you all. Well, at 7.15, um, I know it's been a long Thursday. Thank you all for being here tonight, for listening um, to these wonderful panelists. Panelists, you all were awesome. Thank yes. you so much. And Ann, I'm so honored to be here. You want, a, you want the last word? This is your space. Well, I just forgot one thing. Uh, the president of the museum is here, and I would like, Fletcher, would you please stand up? Fletcher Hudson. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Eat. That's the last thing I can tell you. Eat, please. <laughs>